So, if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalms. I was thinking of this even when I was just, um, so Psalms 51. Verse 12. How many of you guys know that in the Bible there are times that different biblical characters within the Bible, different, different biblical people that the Bible focus on deal with heaviness, right? And David is one of them. So David is dealing with some heaviness of some of the decisions he's made, some of the consequences he's facing. This is out of the point where the prophet corrects him and tells him that, that his sin is, is, is clear before the Lord and he needed to repent and be restored. And in verse 12, David says this, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your gracious spirit. Today I want today to just get back to the basics. Sometimes in church, and sometimes I've been at fault for this, we, we kind of dig into some of the like, deeper things, the theolog- or theological things of what the Word of God has to say, and we can get lost in that. We can get lost in wisdom at times. And we have to sometimes just really get back to the foundational truths of what the Word of God says and what we base our life on. Do you guys agree with that? So I wanted today just to be a simple gospel message just to, 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 to kind of refortify the simple truths of who we are and what the Word of God says about us. Amen? You guys, you guys okay with that today? So how many of you guys are overcomplicators? Well, you're in good company because I'm the champion overcomplicator. Okay, so let me give you an example. So we live up in the country, and, you know, we'll have people come up sometimes, and, you know, like family from out of town or something, and they'll be like, hey, you know, I, I, I want to run down, downtown and grab some things or something like that. But they have no idea where they're at, especially at nighttime. You know, you're in the back, in the back road, so it's like, how do I get to Fredonia from here? Or how do I get down to Brockton, the country fair from here? Right? So... It's a really simple thing. All I have to tell them is to take a right, a left, a right, and a left. Simple as that. So go to the end of my driveway, take a right, first stop sign left, next stop sign right, following left, you'll be right at Country Fair. Boom, right there. Simple, right? Anybody could do that. If you were at my house and I gave you those instructions, You'd be like, okay, you get in your car, end of the driveway, right. First stop sign, you hit, okay, now it's the left, so it's right, left, right, left. Simple. I'm there. But me, it's like, okay, now they ask me, so I'm like, okay, so this is how you do it. So get in your car, start it, go down to the end of the driveway, take a right. You're going to drive down the road about a mile and a half, and then at the mile and a half, you're going to hit a stop sign. There's going to be a house right across the street. It's a white house with a barn on the side. If you go right, or if you go right, or you'll go towards Fredonia, but if you go left, that's the way you want to go. That'll be going in the direction towards your destination. Now you'll drive, there'll be a little dip, and then after the dip, there's a really pretty house with a brick front. They got a dog, his name is Max. Just keep going. You'll pass the road by Bear Lake, and then after that, you'll see another farm that has a lot of great vineyards, a really cool great vineyards. You'll go down the dip, there'll be a trailer park, you'll finally hit that stop sign. Now you could go straight, that'll take you to Westfield, but you don't want to go to Westfield. You'll be on 380, and then it curves up towards Stockton if you follow it, you'll go by Mike and Jody's house. But if you take a right there like you're supposed to, You'll follow it, you'll go through some S-turns, and uh, be really careful because on the S-turn, you could go back onto Webster Road, and that'll take you back to Fredonia where we don't want to be. But if you you go through the S-turns, you follow it all the way down, um, you'll hit another stop sign, that's Route 20. You take a right, you're going towards Fredonia again, left, you're going to go right to Country Fair. 
Now, if I told them that, right, I mean, if I told you that and you had no idea of where you're at, how, would you get to where you need to be, right? You'd be lost. I gave you, yeah, I would give you a whole lot of unnecessary information, right? I just filled your mind with clutter. So even though all those things are true, I, I really, truly told you all the things that you would see and experience along the road, <clears throat> But, but if you have all of those facts and you don't have the simple, basic truths, the things that really mean the most to you, it's going to get lost in the mix, right? How often do we do that in other areas, right? You know, you want to tell somebody of an experience that you, you had. And how many of you people know people like this, right? So you, you, you're like, hey, I want to tell you a story that just happened just, just a few hours ago. You know, it was a really cool experience that I had with so-and-so. So let me tell you about it. So when I was 12, <laughs> and they go for 45 minutes about their whole life that has nothing to do with what they're really intending to tell you, right? Until they finally get to the point, and by that point, you're totally lost, right? Totally overcomplicated overcompli- it. How many of you guys know people like that? You know when they're going to tell you something, you're going to be there for like at least an hour. Yeah. And if you don't know somebody, maybe you are that somebody. So, <laughs> right? And, you know, or another, another simple one, too, is like, you know, we have a boat, and I love teaching people how to water ski. You know, to teach somebody a skill that you have. And if you, te- if you teach somebody of a skill that you know, and, it, and it's simple, and you actually can just do it, just it's like muscle reflex by this point. You don't even think about it, you just do it. But then you try to teach them that, so you start to really dissect every little aspect of it. And, you know, and one, one of the things I love to do is in the summertime, take the youth or the kids up there and, you know, take them on the tube or, you know, whatever. But teaching them to do something as simple as just getting on water skis, and it's like you start to break down every, so okay, now you got to get in the water, you got to bend your knees, you got to keep your arms straight, you got to have your knees between your legs, you know, um, you got to hold on to the rope and balance and you give, an, you give them like a 300 point lesson on what to do when you just don't even tell them about the fundamentals. Hold on to the rope, <laughs> keep your legs together and don't stand up too fast. That's really all you have to tell them. All these other little intricacies about it will work themselves out, right? But but if you tell them all these other things, I've noticed doing that, all of a sudden, they're just, they're trying to do everything. They're falling all over the place. They have no idea on the the, the simple things that matter most. And we do the same with our faith, don't we? Right? And, and we clutter our mind with all of these ideas and all of these, these, these things, and, we, and then we kind of intermingle them into, into the simple gospel. And then after a while, if we're not careful, even our own heart can become cluttered and confused. How many of you guys can relate to me with that? And I even believe for, for, for myself Sometimes the enemy comes in and he just continues to throw his darts, his ideas, his thoughts at you. And after a while, you start to think, okay, you know, where am I in my walk with the Lord? And what do I need to be doing? What do I need to be focusing on? And there's so many different things that are just flooding your mind that it brings confusion. And it's not meant to be there. And sometimes I know that I'm at fault even being a communicator of that to you guys, that we have to be really careful about really just sticking to the fundamentals at time. What does the Bible have to say? You know, what is the simple truth of the gospel? How do we know that we are saved? You know, how does the, what does the Bible explain about that, right? Because 1 Peter 3.15 says this, It says, worship the Lord, worship Christ as your Lord of your life, and and if somebody asks you about your hope as a believer, 
Always be ready to explain it. Now that's the New Living Translation. It's just a really simple, but it's 1 Peter 3.15. Worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if somebody asks you of your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Be, well, be ready to defend it, that word says in some translations. To have a defense. And that word to explain really truly means to be able to write it down plainly. So we should have a simple explanation of the hope we have as believers in Christ Jesus. So simple that we can write it down as our defense. But too often, if somebody asks you, okay, you know, what makes you, what, what makes you so hopeful as a believer? What, explain to me why, why you have this hope and I don't. I mean, we're, we're ready to like, okay, let's go back to the very beginning. In the beginning, <laughs> you know, God created the heavens and the earth. And we, we want to recite the whole Bible to them. You know, and all, is, all is the word is saying is to give them a simple explanation of the hope that we have as believers in Christ Jesus. And that is so important for us as believers because it keeps us, it keeps us grounded. It keeps us centered. And we need to have that in our lives. In today's culture today, there are so many opinions. Even in the Christian, even in the Christian um, culture that we live in, there's so many opinions, so many different ideas. It can bring overload to us. But the bottom line is, 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 is none of that matters. What matters is what God says. Amen? Amen. I love this. Romans 3. Four says this, let God be true and every man a liar. And that's true. Let God be true. Let his, his word, let the scriptures be true in your life. It doesn't matter what people's opinions are. I thank you, Jim, for, Pastor Jim, for sharing that. It doesn't matter what other people think of you. What matters most is what the word of God says about you. What God thinks of you, Amen. Now, that can be twisted and contorted in the wrong way. Like, no one can judge me but God. I've seen those tattoos and other things and that attitude. And we have to be careful not to fall, fall to that as well. But the, same, but the same is true, is let the word of God define who we are. Let the simple truth of the gospel define who we are. When we get to that place, there is such a peace knowing that we are a child of God. And it's a simple place to exist. And we don't have to overcomplicate it. That same scripture says that, says, that you may be justified in your words and overcome when you are judged. So what I believe that it's saying is, is, is hold fast to the word of God. Hold fast to the simple truth of what God says about you. And this plan of salvation. Because if we hold fast to that, our words will be justified and we will overcome. That's a promise. Amen? So, we're going to get there in a minute. The enemy loves this world of opinions. It's full of pride. What's an opinion? Opinion, opinion is basically saying, let me tell you what I think because I'm right. <laughs> I mean, that's what an opinion is, right? Let me tell you my point of view on the subject. And by the way, I've appointed myself as an expert. <laughs> that's what an opinion is. Everybody has opinions. And the world's full of opinions. But the, what the world needs and what I need isn't another opinion. What, the, what I need, what my family needs, what this church needs, what this community needs, what my heart needs to live and exist in a, the safe place that God has for me is simple truth. Simple truth. 
I don't have to, to, to dazzle people with my intellectualism. I don't have to do it. Because guess what? It ain't going to oppress God. Right? God uses the foolish things, the simple things, right? To, the, to confound the wise. Though the base things, those things is what God embraces. When we have that heart of humility instead of that heart of pride, that's where God, that's where God exists and speaks the clearest to us. Amen? So I want to get back to it. And this is the, the great thing about when we come upon this time and this year when we, when we point to the cross, it reminds us, right? It reminds us of the simple truths. And that's the thing that I wanted to share today. It's like, thank God, as we prepare ourselves for what's to come in these next couple weeks, and we look back to what God has done for us on the cross, it brings us back to that sure foundation, right? Just that clear, clarion call of the gospel. Amen? I remember when I was first getting into ministry, and I'd be in these, like, these, these, um, different pastors' meetings and different things, and, and, you know, the different pastors and stuff would be talking about the gospel, and they would just kind of glaze over it. They'd be like, okay, we got to know about the gospel. And then they would talk about all these different things. I'd be like, wait a minute, breaks. Let's talk about the gospel, right? And then they'd be talking about all sorts of other things, and it's just like, no, breaks. Let's go back to the gospel, amen? That's where we need to be, amen? And I thank God for this time and and the season of the cross and how it brings us back to uh, God's story of redemption. It brings us back to that, bed, that bedrock of truth. And that's what Jesus said. Like when we think in we, about Matthew 7, think about Jesus when he talks about the wise man. He says it digs down. He finds that bedrock of truth. And he builds his life upon it. That is the wise man. And that's where we need to be is to get back to those, those roots again. And Jesus never tried to overcomplicate things. You know, we have, today, we can dissect Jesus' words. Jesus can say one simple truth. You know, it could be just a few words. And man, you could have so many different, different, um, it, different takes on it. But we, but we can get lost in that. We just need to remember what Jesus is communicating. He never overcomplicated it. He always tried to take these simple, practical truths and make them digestible to the people. And that's what he wants for us. Because sometimes, you know, you ask people like, you know, do you read the Bible? They're like, oh, the Bible's so hard to understand. You know, I don't understand it. I read it, but I don't understand it. When we read the words of Jesus, I mean, when he was talking to the people of, of his day, he was giving them different analogies of farming and culture and things that they could relate to. And it's still to us today. Jesus wasn't trying to speak over them. He was speaking to them. And the Word of God does the same for us today. If we just would just, just, just be still in the moment and say, God, I know that your word isn't trying to go over top of me. It's, it's, it's being spoken to me. It's spoken directly into my heart. And you just receive it as a child, just to receive that simple truth. You don't have to understand everything. I don't under, understand everything. Every time I read the word of God, something new can be illuminated. And, and, and there's things that even to this day, I just say, okay, God, what the heck do you mean in this moment? You know, what are you trying to say? I don't understand it all. And you know what sometimes the Holy Spirit says is don't worry about that. Don't concern yourself. That's not for you right now. That's for a different time or a different season in your life. Right now, you focus on what I'm telling you. That's the beautiful thing about the Bible. And that's what we need to get back to. Because Jesus is speaking directly to you. It's his letter to you. Not to somebody else. It's not to Adam. I mean, it is to you, Adam. I'm sorry. But, you know, it's not to the person next to you. The Bible is this, this incredible letter written by God for you. Amen? So.
All right. Jesus, in a moment when he is, there's a couple points where the Bible records where Jesus is like, um, he is just over the top with just enthusiasm and just elated with joy. And one of those moments is when he is celebrating the simpleness of God's plan. And it says this, when, and he's talking, he's praying, and he's speaking, and the disciples are witnessing this. In Luke 10, 21, he says, the hidden things, these hidden things are, are hidden from the wise and the prudent, but they are revealed to the babes. So I thank God for like messages. I thank God for truths like that, right? Sometimes when I'm reading the Bible, sometimes I can feel overwhelmed, but I just remind myself of 1 Corinthians 1. It's like, God, you use the simple things. Like, that's maybe why God called me to be a pastor is because he says, okay, let me think about who, you know, on earth right now, who is one of the most simple people on the face of the earth? Josh, there he is. He's the most simplest guy I know. I'm going to call him to be a pastor, you know, because, because I feel so inadequate. But the, the Bible tells me that God uses those people. That's the people he, very, he delights himself in. So praise God for that. And I remind the Lord of that often. I'm like, okay, Lord, you, your word says you use you know, the simple. And here I am, so use me. Jesus, in, in his word, is always pointing to God's redemption plan. And you know what? In that redemption plan, he does something really simple. He makes some real simple truths. Now, these are some of the simple truths. These are foundational truths of who we are, who he is, and our relationship with him. He makes clear our condition. He never, he never glazes over our condition. He, he declares, you're all in need of me. Every single one of you. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. He makes that clear. Another simple truth is this. Is he's upfront with the consequences. So he first is clear with our condition. The second, he's clear with the consequences. And the consequence is, is that the wages of sin are death. We all deserve judgment. We all deserve God's wrath. But it doesn't end there. It would be a sad. It would be a sad story, right? I don't think the Bible would be as popular if Jesus says, "Okay, that's it. Sorry, guys. Good luck." <laughs> but, but then it continues. The story continues. Jesus continues these simple truths. He says, "Okay, now that you know your condition, yes, you have fallen from my glory. You have turned your back on me. Yes, the consequence is I am just, and the consequence is death." But thirdly, Jesus continues the story. He says, but I have come to give you life. To give you life and life more abundantly. I have come to take on those consequences through the cross. I'm going to pay your debt. I'm going to buy you back. Because I love you that much. The th next is he provides a choice. I love what Tim said today. It's a choice. It's a matter of if we receive or not by faith. If we, we choose to believe what God says about this plan is true personally and intimately to us. And we welcome that life and we welcome that truth into our life. He provides a choice and then he explains the conclusion. So he He's clear about the condition. He's upfront about the consequence. He shares the story of the cross. He provides the choice that he is the only way. Guys, I'm going to tell you, this world today is mixing with the cross all sorts of different ideas that don't belong in our hearts. Also, all sorts of psychological things and ideas and spiritualism and all things like that. We got to be careful 
if the Bible doesn't talk about it, it doesn't need to be in there. We have to be really careful. We can't intermingle. We can't take this and that and then put them into our belief system. And I see people doing that nowadays, and we have to be really careful about that. I met a guy at Country Fair, and I was talking to him. He's like, yeah, I believe in, you know, I'm a born-again believer. He knew, all, he knew all the right things to say. And I was like, oh, you know, that's great. I'm like, and, and, and I'm like yeah. And so I started to ask him some questions, and, he, and next thing he's you know, he's talking to me about, like, spiritual enlightenment and following this so many point paths of Buddha and all these other things. So he was, like, covering all of his bases. He, just like, took all of these different religions and mixed them into one melting pot. And he says, well, this is my, this is my, my religion. And he was trying to sell it to me. And the Word of God says, be careful of those people. Don't allow them to speak into your life. It says, don't even have company with them. So... So we have to be careful not to allow that to happen in our own life because it will create confusion. I know we're getting close to the end. I'm going to wrap it up here in a minute. But one important thing, too, is even when I'm saying don't overcomplicate it, this is a word of caution. This is the caution, and it's really important that in this age of technology, we don't oversimplify it. And what do I mean by that? Is this. Is, I remember one time when I was in high school, I had a close friend of mine, and you know, we were talking, somehow faith got brought up. And, and I still wasn't quite clear. I knew about Christ. I was kind of, I was raised a little bit in a church and Sunday school, so I, had, I, I, I knew who he was. I believed, but I really hadn't, I hadn't surrendered yet. And he's like, oh, you don't, have, you don't have to surrender, none of that. He goes, you know, my mom, my mom taught me. He goes, all you got to do is when you get to the pearly hates of heaven, when they ask why, why God's going to let you into heaven, you just say, you know Jesus, they'll let you right in. <laughs> he was like, I was like, wow, that seems pretty simple, right? Somebody's done all the hard work for me. All I got to do is just kind of re, refabricate that when I'm at the heaven's gates, right? But it doesn't work that way. It's in this day of information, this day where we allow everything, every, everything but ourselves to do the thinking for us. It's like we're talking about directions. All we want to do is plug it into our GPS and bada boom, bada bing, we're there, right? It's just going to say take a left here, right there, so many miles down the road, we're going to be right to where we, we belong. But we don't want to do any of the work, we don't want to do any of the thinking, we don't want to do any of that. But there is a responsibility as his children to truly know the very, the very foundational parts of why we're his children. Not just, to, just to, to try to fake it till we make it and all of those things. Because what happens is I remember when we went to the ark with the church a few years back is GPSs can lead you in the wrong place too. I remember being in Cincinnati and next thing I know, we're doing this endless loop around the city <laughs> over and over again. And I'm like, this something is wrong with this thing. Throw this thing out the window. It's telling me to go up one or you know one way streets the wrong direction i was like absolutely frustrated and about ready to have a meltdown so it is important that we do know cuz faith is not mindless people faith is not mindless we don't we don't put our faith in just empty empty things we put our faith in a person we put our faith in, in Christ Jesus, and we understand his story. We understand his redemption plan. That's what we put our faith into, amen? The question is, 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 is why do we believe? Why, why do I believe this thing? What do I believe in? Where did I come from? Who do I belong to? When did it change for me? And how did I get here? These are good questions to ask. And they're good questions to have a simple answer to, right? 
It says this in Philippians 3.1. Paul says this. He says, To write the same things again is no trouble for me, and it is a safeguard for you. Apostle Paul knew that there were certain things that the church needed to understand and to have a, a, a belief in, but to even understand it. And Apostle Paul says, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to major on the important issues. And if i got to repeat them over and over again until it just is, is ingrained into your mind and into your heart, it's no trouble to me, and it will safeguard your life. And the same is true with us. We need to know the direction we're heading and who we belong to. Amen. In this world today, it is easy to lose ourselves, and we must constantly remind ourselves of our core beliefs. This is it. I am a Christian. Okay. It's good to know that we're Christians, right? But what makes you a Christian? It's a good question to ask, right? And if we ask, everybody's probably thinking, please don't call on me, because I would feel the same way. (laughs) This is a trap. I don't want to be called on. But why are you a Christian? What makes you a Christian, right? It's simple. You have become a follower of Jesus Christ. That defines you. You... You no longer are chasing after yourself or this world. You're chasing after something much different. You are pursuing your creator. You are pursuing your savior. You have put your faith and your trust and your belief system is in the Lord Jesus Almighty. Well, then, okay. So that's, I'm a Christian. I believe. I've put my faith in Christ, right? But why do you why why him? Why not somebody else? Well, that's because he is the Son of God, right? Well, how do you know this? Good question. Thanks for asking. <laughs> because the Bible says so, right? It's just like this, you know, you know, the simple truths. Why why do we know what we know, or why do we trust in what we trust? Because the word of God declares so, right? We know Jesus is the Son of God because the Word says that He's so. Well, why do you believe that the, why do you trust in the Word? Good question. Thanks for asking, right? But the the Word is, is the only inspired work of God. We can, we can trust in this thing. It's trustworthy. We can go into it and we'll talk about this later because we can really dissect some of these questions and ask these questions of, of, you know, why do we build our life off of the word? Why is the word such a, 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 trust, a trustworthy source? There's so many reasons why. Let me give you just one reason. Because a lot of people are going to say, let me tell you how to live your life and God will, God will, you will be justified in God's, in God's eye. But when it comes down to it, if it comes down to their belief system and they're really challenged to their belief system, They might crumble. Darwin, with evolution, crumbled at the moment of his demise. He cried out for mercy. And so many other people that have given their opinions and their belief systems, when it comes down to it, when the rubber meets the road, they are frightened beyond all. But most of the people that have penned the word of God and have allowed God to speak through them paid the ultimate sacrifice joyfully. All of the disciples besides John were martyred for their faith. And they did it with with just an enthusiastic expectation of, man, the moment I take my last breath, I know where I'm going to be. I'm going to be in the presence of Jesus. When When that was challenged, when they were challenged, the Word of God confirms confirms that authenticity, not only because God spoke through them, which He did, but also through their witness and their testimony of how they lived. Amen? But that's for another day. But the Word declares, I have a Savior 
He is mine. I have received him in faith, right? Because look, this, the, 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 the situation, and I shared it earlier, is we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But God has provided a way of escape through his son, Jesus Christ. And all who confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead, which we know the word of God confirms it. And there's other reliable sources that confirm that confirmation. So many testimonies of people throughout the ages. But man, if, if, if I have to put my faith and my trust in any one thing, it's going to be that. Amen? And it's simple. And it brings assurance to me. It brings me to the place where I'm unwavering. I'm unshakable. I'm on this firm foundation right now. I'm reading this book. It's called Artemis. It's incredible. It talks about Christ being that firm foundation, that cornerstone. And you know what? When I build myself off these simple principles, when the enemy comes to attack, I can be like, you got nothing. Them might be true. I might have made mistakes, but them are covered under the blood of Jesus. They no longer define me. The act of my Savior, the work of the cross is what defines me. It says that I am love, that I am a child of God, that I am glory bound, that I will be with Jesus, that he delights himself with me. Psalm says this. Psalm says this about his children. And I love this. We're reading we're, a different book I'm reading right now, too. But this is something, and I'm going to end in this. But this is a truth. And this is what the Word of God says. Is what, what, took, what took Jesus to the cross? Why did Jesus go to the cross? What's that? His love for us, right? His love for you. He, desi- he did not desire for any should perish, but all should become to repentance. All should be saved. He doesn't, he doesn't desire to lose one of us in this room. And he leaves us that free choice. But it's for our, us to choose. And it's us for us to build that foundation on this simple gospel. But the Word of God says this in, in Psalms 139. It says that God's thoughts for us outnumber the grains of the sand. Think about that. God thinks about you more than every granule of sand on the face of this planet. Now, if you've been to the beach, we live by Lake Erie. I mean, it has some sand in spots. Can you you even number just one beach? Think about the entire ocean. How much sand is in it? God says, I think about you more than that. God delights himself. He sings over us. If I'm going to put my trust in any one person, it will be the person that loves me the most. And I've never found anyone more than Christ who could love me more. Amen?